I want to calculate this probability, probability of getting 50 heads when, coin, when tossing uh, a coin 100 times. I, if I want to do that, how can I calculate this? So this is what, uh, <coughs> this is the answer to, uh, we know the answer. The an answer is 100 choose 50 p raised to k 1 minus p raised to n minus k. We know the answer. Uh, we know the equation, but uh, uh, how do I solve it? Right, so uh, you can use your computer to find this, but this was not possible during Bernoulli's time. Okay, uh, just because this uh, involves uh, calculations of very very large numbers. So this finding out this was not possible during Bernoulli's time. So what does people do? So people ask, okay, can I approximate this number? Is there some better way I can find this number? But uh, 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 even if it's an approximate one, it's good enough. And uh, so this is what Demur comes up with. So Demur comes up with an approximate formula and uh, along with it, he introduces what uh, we now call as a normal distribution. This is the formula Demur came up with. So this is called as the normal distribution. Uh, it's famously called as it's called as a normal distribution and you might have heard it as a bell curve there's an, another name called as Gaussian distribution now in this uh, formula so you, this mu this mu is called as a mean of this uh, distribution and sigma square is the variance okay and now uh, we, we will see a more proper um, understanding of this formula so what he showed is that the probability of getting k heads in n tosses of a bias coin now you can approximately get this value if you just substitute this you just substitute k with k by n minus p and mu which we said is the mean by n p and sigma which is called sigma is called as a standard deviation and sigma square is called as a variance and sigma by n p q okay uh, so uh, yeah and so if, if someone asks you the question so th and then uh, what uh, uh, what's being said is that so this if you substitute these values uh, in this normal distribution equation you're going to get <coughs> the probability of getting k heads in n tosses of a coin with bias p you're going to get an approximate value which, but which is very close to the real value so you know the real value how to so the real value is going to look like this and it's a binomial distribution now so so let, let's try to answer this question so if you wanted to get the answer to probability of getting 50 heads uh, when you toss the coin 100 times what is it you have to do you have to substitute k by 50 n by 100 1 by 2 minus and if you are let's say you, you are having a fair coin so minus 1 by 2 x is equal to 0 mu is n is 100 p is uh, half 50 sigma is n is 100 p and q are half q is 1 minus p the probability of tails so sigma becomes 100 into 1 by 4 which is 25 and you can substitute these values x mu and sigma here in this formula and you're going to get the probability of getting uh, uh, 50 heads when you toss a fair coin 100 times so this distribution uh, it was uh, uh, during Demur's time it was called as a bell curve why is it called as a bell curve because it looks like a bell curve as you can see uh, what uh, what we have done here is that we have placed the binomial distribution here and on top of it I have placed the this bell curve okay now this bell curve, uh, uh, so uh, you can see it's it's close relation, right? So the the bell curve and the binomial distribution they are um, they seem to be close to each other, right? Um, yeah. Uh, now the reason for calling it uh, uh, the reason for calling it normal distribution is something we, have, we will soon see. So right now let's call it bell curve. So uh, so let's some some observations. So where is the mean of this distribution? So the mean of this distribution happens at three because that is as you can see that's that's the the midpoint. So it's it's a symmetric distribution. So if you if I draw a line here, right at three, you can see that the left part is symmetric to the right part. And, uh, and so 
mean, the this, the k is equal to three is kind of is the center of gravity of this the, this bell curve, right? So you can hang the bell at that point, at that location. So that's the center of gravity, and that's the mean of this distribution. Now, <clears throat> because it's the same, what do we call it? Weight on both sides of this uh, of this uh, of this mean. Right, k is equal to three uh, on the left and right. It's the same weight. Therefore, k is equal to three is the mean. So, uh, so in all bell curve, we can notice that the mean happens at uh, the the topmost point. So, in the sense, uh, the mean occurs at the greatest value. Okay. Right. And why is that? So, from the equation, is this true? Okay. When does the mean the greatest? When is uh, this value the greatest? When is this formula phi of x the greatest? So this is greatest when so e raised to is a minus number, right? E raised to a negative number, and uh, what is the so what should this number be? This number should be the greatest, okay? And if I want the greatest, I want this uh, I want this part x minus, but x minus mu square is always positive, right? So and two, uh, sigma square is always positive. So this part is always positive, except when x is equal to mu. In that case, this turns out to be zero. Right. So in all other case, this is going to be e raised to minus some number, right? And uh, when x is equal to mu, this part is uh, zero, and therefore this is equal to one. E raised to uh, zero, and this turns out to be one. Okay. Uh, so that's that's kind of the uh, you can see that. Uh, yeah, so it's one at that point. Uh, sorry, e raised to it's, it's e raised to zero, and so this part becomes one. And that so that so you uh, you can notice that this is the last so the, the the greatest value for this function happens when x is equal to mu. That's also now clear. So uh, now now what is sigma? So that's the uh, next question. What is sigma? So let's try to understand what is sigma. So sigma is what is called a standard deviation of, the, of this distribution, and uh, it, it basically ensures the width of this bell curve. Okay, the bell curve can be this shape, or it can grow uh, wider, or it can grow narrower, depending on sigma. So sigma determines how much wider or narrow this distribution is. Here. Yeah. Now, now the question one should ask is, okay, uh, what happens if sigma is bigger, does it become wider or uh, narrower? Okay, so let's try to find out that from this equation. So, um, sigma has become, let's say, bigger. So, if sigma has come become bigger, sigma square is obviously bigger and x minus mu square, so this, this fraction has become smaller. Okay, and then you can think of e raised to minus just as one by e raised to uh, 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 that number, uh, one by e raised to then uh, it becomes a positive number, and that positive number is now smaller because sigma was bigger. This is uh, now smaller, and uh, one by e raised to has now so e raised to a smaller number uh, means uh, that is smaller, and one by uh, one by e raised to a smaller number uh, becomes one by a smaller number. Which means it's a bigger number. So that means so at the same point. So let's let's take x uh, four here, and now uh, when I increase sigma, I'm going to get a bigger number. So so maybe somewhere here, right? So if my x was at five, uh, which my x is at five, this is five of x this point, and I have now increased sigma. It means I'm going to get a bigger value. It's going to be here. Okay. So, so once uh, it's it's increasing, so therefore it means that so the, 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 this phi of x will be uh, uh, a bigger number. And therefore, what what does it mean? Then you can look at the picture. The the bell curve has become wider. So when sigma gets larger, the bell curve becomes wider. So right. So the width increases as variance increases. Okay. <coughs> now. Okay, so that's also clear. Now, um, now uh, uh, one, 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 one more property which uh, is the following that see this is a probability distribution and therefore the sum if you integrate from 
uh, so you want to find the area under this curve okay the area under this bell curve so to find that out you have to integrate this formula so what is the area under this bell curve so the area under this bell curve is going to be 1 and uh, so these these constants here has been set up uh, this 1 by root 2 pi has been set up exactly to ensure that the area under this curve is 1 so now why is uh, this bell curve so important so once uh, demo uh, showed this use of uh, the application of bell curve that you can approximate this binomial distribution uh, uh, it became useful obviously it became useful to now uh, calculate the uh, so it's, it's clear that it's it's much more easier to uh, calculate using this uh, this equation of bell curve rather than using the binomial distribution when you have large numbers uh, x mu and sigma etc so uh, but that's not the only reason so bell curve after it was been uh, proposed by Dimour, it uh, it became so uh, people observed that it, it appears in lot of areas it became so ubiquitous in uh, in social science in economics in uh, in other sciences etc and it it started to have a life of its own for example uh, so people uh, i mean you, uh, people counted the suicide rate of uh, some some country uh, and they observe that okay, they, it, it's 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 usually following this bell curve. Now, uh, the human height people, uh, you take the height of all humans in this uh, in a in a particular country or a city, and then you observe that it's this it's, it's a neat bell curve. Okay, uh, so you have a median height, and then uh, the the then people are distributed equally on both sides of this median height and it forms a nice bell curve similarly for human weight etc and then that's kind of very surprising as if you could think about it it's very surprising so let's say let's assume that let, let's just think about the suicide rate now why is this surprising so it's in, somehow it's saying that uh, how many people will die in let's say in india this year we have some probabilistic measure of how many people is going to die is going to commit suicide in india this year now this is kind of little troubling right why because what uh, we all tend to believe that or agree that suicide is a matter of personal choice uh, maybe not a good personal choice but it's ultimately if someone decides for himself or herself to commit suicide so None of us should be able to predict what, how, how many people are going to commit suicide because many people are going to take a decision based on their own personal feelings. But somehow, this bell curve is saying that even if that is the case, I am able to tell that how many people are going to commit suicide in this year in India. And I can give a probabilistic estimate of of this rate so in some sense you, even if you can't tell whether a particular individual is going to commit suicide or not even though you have no information of that fact as a mass as a, as a human society as a community you can make judgments about the entire community you can tell that an that entire community is going to commit this many suicide even though i can't pinpoint any person and tell uh, anything about uh, uh, any I mean, I, I can't tell any anything about that person's uh, suicidal tendencies. It shows up in many of this, uh, many other areas like human height, uh, weight, and not just human, like animal heights and weights. There's something natural in this. That's that's the kind of understanding people get. So there's not something natural that uh, bell curve with some something to do with the with the world uh, that bell curve comes up everywhere like this. That's what uh, one finds out. So therefore, it, it became so much of people became so much curious in bell curve, and they wanted to know which all kind of what all kinds of social phenomena, scientific phenomena, etc., satisfies this bell curve. Uh, is it the case that the height of elephants in the wild are going to form the bell curve? Right. So this, these are questions one can answer, uh, one can ask. Uh, right. So therefore, uh, so this, so th that's that's kind of the. 
want motivation to study bell curve but uh, we are going to have we are going to see lot more applications of bell curve now <clears throat> so here is an exercise you can do um, so uh, a few exercises so first test uh, why don't you do the following you can try to plot in uh, matlab or python the normal distributions for various mean and the values of mean and variance and uh, see the width of the distribution changing with variance Next, another question is that uh, can I calculate what I mean by uh, hand. What is the probability of getting exactly 50 heads when tossing 100 fair coins? Okay, so use this normal distribution to approximate this value. And uh, uh, next, alter, another question is what is the probability of getting at least 50 heads when tossing 100 fair coins? So can you integrate this uh, this distribution till 50 and uh, find out? Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. So at least 50 years. So do you have to integrate if it's a fair point? So these are questions. So you, you should answer this yourself. Now, uh, what, so what is the last question? So if I had asked what is the probability of getting at least 25 heads, uh, how, how will you, what is the answer to that? Okay, so these are things you should try to find out. Uh, the last question is, let's assume the number of people who go to a, so you have a local movie theater, theater in your area. And let's assume that daily, the daily flow of people who go to the theater uh, follows the normal distribution. So the number of people who go to this theater follows a normal distribution with mean 100 and various variance 20. Okay. Uh, let's just assume that. Now the question is, what is the probability that in a year? Uh, the question is, what is the probability that in a year? Uh, that's 365 days, 4,000 people went to this theater. We have introduced the bell curve as a, as a very useful probability distribution which approximates the binomial uh, distribution. But we, we also saw that uh, this bell curve comes up in many areas of real life. So there has to be something more fundamental about this uh, about this bell curve and that's what we are trying we will we'll try to understand now so it all started with uh, an assumption which Gauss made now Gauss was uh, one of the greatest mathematician who have lived now so Gauss was not just a mathematician he was also an astronomer he used to study the movements of planetary objects uh, most uh, many mathematicians at that time were interested in both this um, I mean people used mathematics to study uh, to predict the rotation and uh, rotation of planetary objects like stars uh, planets moon etc a okay. um, lot of religions were based on the planetary movements and uh, so there which made uh, a precise cal calculation of uh, planetary objects um, interest to uh, of interest to religion too so uh, and and, and um, the, the scientific mind was also interested right, on uh, what are these objects there and how are they moving etc so uh, it's, it's interest to humans in general right now uh, so Gauss was one of this um, uh, I mean so like many others Gauss was also trying to predict the planetary movements uh, the the is going to predict the path of uh, the movements of some planetary objects and then he predicted correctly the movement of asteroid Cirrus. Okay, so Cirrus got behind the sun and then it and then it was lost and no one knew whether it's going to come back or not. So those predicted that it's going to come back uh, on such and such a year and then it came back um, correctly and so Gauss did this in 1801 and then. Uh, turned goes into an over so this happened exactly so uh, this prediction happened exactly as Gauss predicted uh, so the reappearance of uh, the asteroid Cirrus happened exactly as Gauss predicted and this which which was a remarkable achievement uh, making him an ornate star uh, so uh, I mean his ma mathematical abilities became renowned and accepted by uh, people around and uh, to solve find this 
path of Cirrus uh, Gauss invented a lot of numerical methods. <coughs> uh, but there was a, but what we are interested in is this one main assumption which Gauss made. Okay, that's that's going to be uh, that's going to get connected to our bell curve. Uh, so the the main assumption behind Gauss method was that he so so how, how does this work? How does Gauss uh, uh, how, how is it Gauss going to predict uh, the movement of asteroids? So there's he has to look at a lot of historical data. So historical data of at each um, uh, time where was this asteroid, right? So people have noted down these things in uh, for last few years, and that's that's being recorded. And so Gauss looks at these um, these um, and data and then tries to predict the path and this is uh, present this would be called as a curve fitting problem if you are taking a machine learning course this is something you would learn there now <coughs> so now so okay so now so to, for, for this prediction uh, obviously so many 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 written uh, observations will have small error right because it's it's ultimately it's to err is human, so people make errors, and uh, I mean machines which record and uh, record make errors. So so many of this record um, the many of the observations of this planet and the movement of this asteroid was uh, can be assumed to be have small slight errors, and uh, what goes assumed was this the recorded observation was following a bell curve. Okay, that's what Gauss assumed. So, the, so that is it's So, the mean is if the mean is the the correct position, you're going to err on both sides, and you're going to be close to the mean most of the time. But you can go here and there. So that's an assumption Gauss made that the recorded data uh, observations of this asteroid was following a bell curve. Now, why should this be true? Okay, because Gauss entire mathematical basis was based on this assumption uh, and his prediction seemed out to be extremely accurate. So there's something fundamentally true about this assumption. Uh, so people was wondering why should this be true? Why should uh, this be that the recorded observations of asteroid follow a bell curve? Now one answer lies in uh, how experiments are conducted? How do people, uh, scientists, conduct experiments? So, what mostly what scientists do? Is, scientists take multiple observations and take its average, and then that average value is noted down as the valid observation. Now, why do you do this? Because you don't want to make. Uh, I mean, you just do one observation, and you don't want that to be an erroneous observation. So, you take multiple observations, and then you uh, take an average of all these values. So, that's one way scientists uh, record data. So this was true, but then, uh, uh, but why should this still? That does not explain the reason that uh, that the recorded observations has to follow a bell curve, right? So that's where Laplace comes in. Okay. So Laplace provided the mathematical justification for this um, conundrum, as you can say. And uh, what did he say? So this is uh, called as the central limit theorem. And so what? Uh, Laplace said this. So Laplace was a, a mathematician of uh, repute, and what Laplace said was that you see, you, you consider any uh, probability distribution, and you consider any probability distribution, and just take some sample data from that probability distribution. Now, if you take that sample data from that probability distribution, and you're going to average of, um, so let's say you take some twenty um, sample from that probability distribution. So according to 20 samples from that probability distribution. Okay. You pick those 20 and then you take its average. Okay. And Laplace said that that average is going to be a bell curve. Right. That's what Laplace said. Now, why is this, uh, how is this connected to Gauss, assumption of Gauss? You, so uh, that's because, why, why is that true? Because most scientists take multiple <coughs> observations and then take its average and that's what we have been telling that this average recorded data is for is following a bell curve and that's the basis on which was predicted the 
and the moment of asteroids so they have, so this so, so suddenly the central limit theorem places bell curve as kind of a very fundamental uh, distribution because it's saying that you take any probability distribution you're going to get you're going to take an average you're going to get the bell curve so hello let's try to understand the central limit theorem so let this be a probability distribution some arbitrary probability distribution now what i'm going to do is the following i'm going to take let's say some 20 samples from this uh, probability distribution so this is so on the y-axis it's the probability and on the x-axis it's, it's this is some uh, so the x-axis is the real line so on y-axis is the probability and x-axis is the real line and <coughs> We are going to pick some numbers from here um, based on the probability distribution. Okay, and I'm going to what I'm going to do is that so let's say I take let's say 20 samples. I'm going to just take these 20 samples x1 plus x2 plus up to x20. I just take this 20 samples and I just took its average 20. Okay, and I'm going to plot this value. So, what will this value be? What, I mean, according to you, what is the expected value of this A1? So, the expected value is going to be the mean of this original probability distribution. Okay, that's because of linearity of expectation. That's something we saw, right? Because E of A1 is equal to E of X1 uh, plus E of X2 up to E of X20 by uh, 20. Right. So, due to a linearity of expectation, you can expect that uh, the expectation of A1 is uh, is equal to the expectation of this probability uh, function. Now, that's good. So, I'm going to plot this in, uh, I'm going to plot this. So, uh, so I just, uh, so let's say this, it, it happens at, uh, so this is A1, let's say. So, this is A1. Okay. And uh, I'm going to plot. Uh, um, what 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 is it I want to plot? So I'm going to do this, repeat this experiment multiple times. I I found out a one, and then I'm going to do a two again. So that's what what does it mean? I again take some random twenty samples, and I uh, take its average. So I get a two just like this. Then I get a three just like this. And I'm going to do do this. Let's say hundred times a one, a two, up to a hundred. So all these things are going to lie somewhere here, let's say. So they are all going to lie somewhere here in this um, real line. And then I'm going to make this see how many times each of this value has come. Okay. So if I do that, what I'm going to get is I'm going to get uh, I'm going to get a normal distribution. Okay, so you take some samples, take their average, and do this experiment many times and plot that, plot that distribution, you're going to get the normal distribution. So this is the bit current. What is the mean of this distribution? So this is like the normal distribution, let's say. And what is the mean? The mean is the expected value of this original distribution. Let me call it. Let me call this or, original distribution beta. So the mean of this normal distribution this is is the mean of beta. Okay, that's something we saw because the expected so the expected value of uh, both these distribution has to be the same. It does not matter which distribution you start with. That's the crucial thing. No matter which distribution you start with, if you do this, if you note down the average uh, of uh, or some reasonable number of samples, you take a reasonable number of samples and take its average, and it's going to follow the normal distribution, independent of what your original distribution was. That's this is central limit theorem, and that this makes it. 
that and the, this is the reason why this bell curve is called as normal distribution because now this is a very fundamental uh, distribution in some sense right because every distribution in uh, if you sample any distribution and take its average you're going to end up in a normal distribution so let's say you had started with a different distribution okay and you do the same thing you are going to end up in another normal distribution you are going to end up in a, a different normal distribution with whose uh, mean and variance will be different uh, from what we have uh, drawn above but you are going to still end up in a normal distribution that's the main point of central limit theorem let's see what the central limit theorem is saying in precise mathematical notation uh, this will this is how this is the statement of central limit theorem we have seen the normal distribution and how the normal distribution can approximate the binomial distribution and then we also saw the central limit theorem which which made which which uh, is the reason why the bell curve is called as the normal distribution and so that that made the normal distribution as fundamental to uh, in, among all the distribution that looked like a fundamental distribution Good. next uh, but we are still uh, we are still puzzled by this question why is height normally distributed among humans so let's just consider uh, either uh, male height or female height in a place so either male height or female height, it's going to be normally distributed. Now, <clears throat> why is this happening? Um, that's what has been puzzling many people because uh, it's kind of uh, it's, a, it's a surprising fact. So there has to be since it's um, uh, since I mean there has to be some reason. Uh, for this to happen and one needs to find this out. So this has been puzzling many people and uh, In fact the size of animals are also normally distributed size of animals uh, who which grow in the wild they're also normally distributed and The a person called as Sir Francis Galton. He was also puzzled by this. So who was Francis Galton? So he was a statistician mathematician uh, He was a geneticist or you can call it an explorer or a eugenist uh, he was many things, um, and, um, but in the history of world, you can call him a villain. His ideas on uh, he had ideas on racial purity, and he would he would want uh, when you, he would be okay with people. He would be okay with inferior races being eliminated, and uh, he wanted the government to create policies which encouraged superior races to um, to marry for example and create uh, children so uh, i mean so i mean it's it's not just uh, 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 francis galton who had these ideas but, uh, uh, so this was a time when genetics and all these ideas of genetics were coming up and uh, there are a lot of people with similar ideas on racial purity and racial superiority and things like that so these and uh, and the ideas of sterilizations and how you have to <coughs> um, a, a nation state has to uh, generate better what is called as better people uh, people with better genes these are the ideas which have been prevalent with among many people and these kind of ideas led to uh, a lot of forced sterilization of inferior people in the uh, united states of america which was taken to an extreme limit by the Nazi Germany and uh, all these ideas came to an end with the end of World War II. Okay, so this was uh, uh, Francis Galton, but uh, he was curious to find out this the answer to this question: Why is height normally distributed? So, so what he did is that he conducted the following experiment: He collected different sweet peas, and he gave different kinds of sweet peas to his friends. He gave one friend lighter seeds, another friend heavier seeds. And he asked his friends to grow and uh, then he went back and collected their progenitor children. And each of the children were normally distributed. Okay, so, each, so, so there was this, uh, lighter children uh, and they, they formed a normal distribution. There was heavier children, they formed their own a normal distribution. 
and he also observed that the but the mean so this the mean of the heavier children was heavier than the mean of the lighter children okay so clearly the the heavier children are fundamentally heavier than the lighter guys okay? but uh, uh, statistically speaking this uh, yeah. okay so this was the scenario next the next thing he did is he took mixed parents okay he he he, he want to breed um, let's say a heavier female with a male a, a lighter male so then he uh, mixed them okay and then that led to a next generation of children then he looked at that generation of children and then surprisingly they were normally distributed okay and where was the mean of this so the, the mean of this distribution is to the is lesser than the mean of the heavy, uh, heavier children but heavier but greater than the mean of the lighter children okay so it's, it's some kind of uh, so it's a normal distribution somewhere in between the other two normal distribution okay now so okay so it's it's clear that this is a normal distribution now you need to give the reason so he proposed the following he said that he said that the height of a child is a linear combination of the height of its parents that's his first uh, proposal okay so each of the parent is the uh, height is a, is a normal distribution and the child also is going to get uh, the child's height is going to depend on there is going to be a linear combination of the height of its parent so some uh, maybe half from mother and half from father or maybe three fourth from mother and one fourth from parent or the other way of uh, one fourth from the father uh, or the male so maybe three fourths from the female and uh, one fourth from the uh, male or vice versa it's some linear combination of the height of its uh, parent so that's that's about height so when you are, if you are talking about sweet peas then it's about the the size okay the, the weight the, uh, so the weight of a child is a linear combination of weight of its parents so that's what uh, galton proposed and then he found out this um, math following mathematical reason it's not that he I mean, it was already known that this mathematical reason was already known he uh, took it and so that's the this is the reason he said that the sum of independent normal random variables is normal so if you take two random variables which are normal random variables and you add them up you're going to end up in, with a new random variable which is normal which is also whose distribution is also normal you take any linear combination of them you're going to end up in a normal distribution so this is a uh, this is a fundamental uh, uh, property he observed so the mean and variance of this new normal distribution is the uh, is the linear combination of the mean and variance of this individual random variables right and so now it's clear that if these two things are uh, uh, you know with these two ideas you can argue that the height is normally distributed why because you can think of uh, one generation of parents having a normal distribution Okay, so height of a child is a linear combination of its parents, and similarly, the height of another child is also a linear combination of its parents. Now, now if you look at all their all children, what is going to be? How how is that distribution going to be? That distribution is going to be a linear combination of all the parents, and we know now from this mathematical theorem, we know that okay, if if the parents already had a normal uh, distribution, then the since it's a, the children's distribution is also going to be a, a, a linear combination of the parents' distribution. You're going to end up in a normal distribution for the children, and this is how um, Galton argued that why height is a norm is normally distributed among humans. And then you can use the same argument to show that size of animals, and let's say the size of elephants in the wild, are also normally distributed. I think uh, with this few slides we have we have come to understand the importance of normal distribution. And uh, it's a normal distribution, as we have been saying. It's also called as a bell curve and also called as a Gaussian distribution. Before we finish this lecture, we are, I want to finish it by finally just take a quick look at modern probability. And modern probability is uh, what one would call as an axiomatic approach. This is like uh, what Euler did long back for you know, geometry. So Euler came up with an axioms for geometry with which you can prove all. Uh, uh, all, all theorems or claims of uh, geometry now so the same way uh, person called as Kolmogorov so Kolmogorov uh, is 
one of the most important figure in probability in the last century and he was a Russian mathematician and he created what he would call as a modern axiomatic so the axiomatic foundations of probability theory so according to him and uh, so probability is a function mapping events sample space to the zero one real line so this is something which we had seen uh, this was the same idea with Bernoulli also but uh, Kolmogorov said no these uh, probability function should also satisfy these set of axioms and, uh, and that says that so any event the probability of any event is going to be going to be between 0 and 1 uh, the probability of the entire the sample space okay, is going to be 1 and the probability of the empty space is going to be 0 then the probability of a union b is equal to probability of a plus probability of b if a and b are disjoint even. so if two sets are there which are disjoint then the probability of a union b is sum of their probability and uh, this, uh, the, that uh, statement is so so all these these axioms are uh, uh, enough for a discrete probability but now if you want to look at continuous probability this is you need one more um, axiom which says that if you look at mutually exclusive you won't need to there is a set of um, mutually exclusive event, events then the probability of the sum of them is equal to the I'm sorry the probability of the union of those sets is equal to the sum of those probability of those events okay this is the axiomatic approach of Kolmogorov. Now, using this, uh, once you, if you understand these axioms, you can try to solve these exercises. So, the first question is, if you show that probability of A bar, which is probability of A complement, is equal to 1 minus probability of A. Second question is, probability of A union B is probability of A plus probability of B minus probability of A intersection B. So, in this case, A and B uh, need not be disjoint. That's why intersection comes into picture. And as you could see, this is closely related to um, the theory, right? The probability of A is equal to probability of A intersection B plus probability of A intersection B complement. And uh, finally, if A is a subset of B, then probability of A is less than or equal to probability of B. So we can try to prove these uh, by using Kolmogorov axiom. And this comes takes us to the end of this talk thank you and i'm going to these are the references i used first is a short write-up by and devnath and basu it's called a short history of probability theory and its application and second is um, a book by ian stewart which book is titled 17 equations that change the world thank you thank you very much